Hello. Uh, thank you so much for this invitation to this glorious building that looks not very much like our London offices, which are more 70s concrete than glorious uh, architecture. So today we're doing a slightly different uh, talk to other people. Uh, what we'll be doing is demoing this new experimental tool that Gina and I have developed uh, called the Hive. A few people have been playing with it already, and it uses the internet. And one slight uh, problem is that Baudelaire did not have great Wi-Fi coverage. This is not the strongest Wi-Fi signal, but we'll see if it works with these phones, and we'll have a demonstration of it later. But to start with, I just wanted to set up why we're doing this and what our, what our goal is. So what we are trying to do is explore the group mind to do a psychology experiments on collective behavior. We've seen some wonderful, wonderful um, observational studies, some interview techniques, way to get, ways to get at these naturally occurring phenomena. What we're trying to do is take some aspect of that, perhaps only a tiny aspect, and put it in the laboratory and manipulate the situation, change people's relationship to what they're doing, and see if we can test hypotheses that are generated elsewhere in psychology. To see if we can see why these Borussia Dortmund fans, not Borussia Dortmund fans from last night, they're all weeping together somewhere in isolation, but why these people gather together and move in synchrony and what that does to their psychology experience of being in these rooms together. Why is it that people at great risk to their own personal safety choose to go out on the streets and protest when they could stay at home and tweet? They could exchange information in that way. But what is it about coming together that brings them... Sorry, could you stay uh, closer to the mic? Okay, sorry. stay close to the mic. Uh, stay here. I can't sit down. I'm very sorry. It just doesn't work. Um, so we're trying to investigate uh, things that classically uh, cognitive psychologists study, things like memory and decision-making that take place in the lab in carefully controlled experiments. But when people leave the laboratory, they use it in much richer social environments, like these people on the Chicago Stock Exchange, using their memory, using their decision-making uh, processes, but doing it in the context of other people. We want to experimentally get at the effect of that context by putting it in and moving it out and seeing how that changes behavior. So. Um, to start with, uh, I don't really need to set this up for this particular crowd, but my own discipline of experimental um, psychology is really very much focused on the individual. Even if you go back to Freud, that's Freud's couch, that only fit one person. If you do a Google image search for intellect, you get Rodin's The Thinker, who's a very lonely man, right? He's surrounded by absolutely no one. And we have this idea about intellect being this process of the single individual, and that's reflected in our psychology experiments for the past 50 years or so. However, if you do look at what uh, intellectuals, what scientists have said of this crowd, as you people well know, it's largely dismissive. These are old ideas in the literature, but they maintain themselves in the media, as we've seen still. So Le Bon says, among the special characteristics of crowds, there are several such as impulsiveness, incapacity to reason, the absence of judgment, and others besides, which are almost always observed in beings belonging to inferior forms of evolution, in women, children, and savages, for example. <laughs> How women can be evolved separately, I'm not sure, but uh, the same remark was made a lot more succinctly um, in the film Men in Black, uh, where um, I've forgotten the Agent J said, a person is clever and people are stupid. That's sort of the default intellectual position and still in the media when we think about the decisions that large numbers of people make. But still, we choose as a society to gather together. We choose to come together and to protest, to engage in rituals where we move and dance. Presumably, that's doing something other than making us more stupid. Otherwise, why would we continue to do those things? So what we're trying to do is to explore the group mind and give people these sorts of decision-making tasks and see how the behavior changes. To do this, uh, we needed to develop a new tool. Oh, sorry, before I say that, uh, we have seen some examples of studying collective behavior before. We saw some um, from Professor Reem and his talk, uh, studies looking at how people move together in synchrony. This research has been mostly done on dyads and pairs of people seeing how they copy each other's body language. That indicates affiliation and liking. It's a way to flirt with people and to persuade them if you copy their body language. And just recently, people are looking at how that scales up. And it's not entirely obvious how or why that happens. There have been some recent studies that were reviewed yesterday. We have our own experiment where we got people in a dance workshop run by a professional choreographer. And they did all these sort of abstract movements and they were wearing wrist accelerometers and we were able to track the exact move and signature of their activity. After they engaged in this 40 minutes of moving together or not, uh, then we put them in a, in a lab and we got them to do various psychological tests. They rated how much they liked each other, they cooperated on a task, and they engaged in a survey. We asked them how much do you agree with this political proposition between one and seven, and then they walked along and they stood along this big scale indicating their opinions. 
and we measured how closely they stood to each other. And what we found is that the movement coordination between people correlates with a whole range of these psychological effects. It's not just simple liking, cooperation changes as well. So what we have here plotted on the x-axis is the coupling between people. This uh, analysis technique called cross-recurrence analysis that gives you sort of a readout of the temporal structure between people. And whether or not people were told to move together or told to move separately, that didn't seem to matter, what we told them to do. How they spontaneously moved and how they started to copy each other's behavior and how this movement synchrony emerged correlated with all sorts of psychological measures. So the closer they moved together in time with each other, the closer they stood next to each other when giving their political opinions, the more they're able to coordinate their behavior on a, on a task. So we know in these cases, when we do studies of five to 10 people, we can track this movement synchrony and we can show that experience of collective action changes how people make decisions about each other. But that's not quite what we're interested in here. We know that there's this I always feel like a microwave has finished cooking. <laughs> um, we know that this sort of uh, group action changes how people feel about each other, but our target is really the decisions that people make, the choices they make, and the experiences that they have. So for that, we, um, we developed this new tool called the Hive, and our very sort of simple question is, well, when can we think of each other as individuals, and when do we act together as a Hive? How do we account for this scientifically? Uh, just as a slight tangent, we got very interested in Ian Cousins' model of animal behavior. And he was pointing out once, if you look at this murmuration of starlings here, there was a scientific explanation of how this million flock of birds, how they're able to coordinate their behavior and move together as one. And the leading scientific explanation up until 1910 was telepathy. That, was the only, that wasn't a fringe view. That was the only explanation people had for how that sort of coordination was possible. Now, of course, we know that what looks like a single organism moving together is the outcome of lots of, lots, lots of uh, local interactions between those starlings. They're following the guy in front and moving in a particular way, and that structure emerges. But the question is, well, when we want to describe populations of people, collectives of people, how do we best describe them? Are they a single entity that we can ascribe psychological attributes to? And when we talk about uh, how Germany is angry with Greece and uh, what England is going to do in the referendum, we ascribe mental state talks but, uh, to large collections of people. But when you're in that collective, what is your psychological relationship to it? We know we attribute mental states to children and to animals, sometimes to computers when they break. Do people attribute a mental state to a collective? And how does that relate to their own sense of agency and control and decision making? What is our best model? Lots of local interactions or one big representation, how the group behaves. So this is our goal, and we created our experimental tool called the Hive. And just to be very clear about this, um, we feel slightly out of place because we've had so many talks here that are the culmination of incredible careers studying all different things. And this is really the beginning of our inquiry here. We've developed this particular tool that we're going to try and use to study collective behavior, but we've only finished building it about a few months ago. We have used it with crowds of up to 40, up to 100, but so far we're right at the beginning. So we're presenting a methodological tool to you today, and we do have some results that Jorini will tell you about uh, later, but we're just at the start of trying to figure out how to use this tool. And since we're studying collective behavior, we thought well, our approach will be collective as a science community. So we're very encouraging of anyone who has any ideas that they could test with our particular tools. We think the phenomena is bigger than we have time to study in our careers. So we're very keen if anyone has a notion of how they could use this system to test their own hypotheses, please do get in touch. Uh, so what the system allows us to do, as we'll see in a moment, is play. People move a dot around on their screens, and hopefully Baudelaire's Wi-Fi permitting. We'll try and do this in a second. They move a dot around on their screen, and you can see on a large central display everyone's dot in the room. So you can see the actions of everyone else as well as your own action. And then we can manipulate stuff like we can in a lab. We can turn those dots on or off. So you're making that decision privately or you're making it publicly. We can color those decisions by asking you your political affiliations or the music you like, and then see how your behavior has changed in the context of people who are your group or not your group. We can also sneakily send messages to 10% of the people, giving them instructions to compete against other people. We have all these experimental tools to manipulate the situation, hopefully replicating some of the uh, studies that we've seen um, in this conference. So let's try playing with the system uh, itself. So. Uh, what we'd like you to do, if you have any sort of device, a laptop, a tablet, or a phone, is go to this website, uh, thehive.sc, that's all you need, and hopefully you can be on the local Wi-Fi or the 3G, 4G, there's very little data is going to be sent back and forth, 
And hopefully if you log on, uh, you'll see a screen and a big orange button that says join the audience. If you click that, it also asks for your age and gender and other things, you don't need to put that in. Uh, it asks for a room number. And if you can put in room number 2120, you should get to a screen Excuse me. Uh, that's just a blank box with a blue dot in it. Then if you put your finger on that dot and move it around, you will see your dot moving around on screen. And we have half a dozen uh, people or so joined already. Hopefully uh, a few more will join. Uh, what you find in this stage while people are connecting is that uh, everyone goes through this minor existential crisis. It all connects and they move and they think, where am I? Which am I in the wilderness? And they wiggle themselves to try and identify themselves so they can see themselves in the crowd. Oh good, so we have a few people joining. And um, what we're going to do is just play a few, uh, give you a few questions, play a few games, and just to give you a feel for how this tool works. And hopefully while we go along, it may spark some idea of how you could test your own hypotheses with this tool. So to start with, uh, you can continue to join uh, during the thing if you're still filling along. Uh, 2120 is the room. Uh, so to start off with, could you all move into the center dot? So everyone who is connected, just drag that dot right into the middle. When I ask undergraduates, they're very obedient, but academics never do. They always want to go on the edges and go against the commands. There you go. Grudgingly, some people are moving in slowly. Okay, that's... I'm stuck. If you hit the reload button, it should, it should start again. What's happening is lots of people are joining and you're getting bumped off the connection, no, I think. It's, it's, so we'll try and move the puck. Oh, no. This is the problem with technology. What room numbers did you say? 2120. Great, so we have some people joining. Usually a refresh solves some problems. I'm not sure about swiping things. So now we've got a few people in our hive, we can start to ask very simple questions. So uh, the first one is simply, how are you feeling? Are you feeling happy, happy, like Pharrell? Not Morton, obviously, he hates him. Uh, or are you feeling miserable, like Morrissey? And all you do, this is a Likert scale along the bottom, so you can go anywhere horizontally, and that gives us an indication. So if you're feeling ambivalent, go in the middle, or go somewhere along this extreme. So this is just simply a Likert scale, the sort of thing we've been using in psychology for a very long time, but normally filled in in private. But here you can see other people's decisions. So we can ask you uh, how you're feeling. We can also ask, if we go to the next screen, so everyone move into the hive again. I just reset it so we know that you're, uh, you're alive. Uh, we can ask other questions like, which superpower would you want? The power of invisibility or the power of flight? This is a famous question in psychology for dividing people. People have strong opinions and then think people who choose the opposite are complete idiots. Uh, normally people who choose flight describe people who choose invisibility as crouching masturbators. That's one explanation I got from someone. Uh, whereas those people who choose flight are shameless thrill seekers. And almost all scientists uh, choose invisibility. Oh, we've got split. That's quite So you can indicate your choices. We can ask you other questions if you go into the hive again. Again, this is not quite science yet. We're still warming up. We can ask you questions like, how often do you pick your nose? Uh, someone constantly is doing it with their other finger as we speak, which is delightful, or never. And this, of course, is a silly question, but it has this slight social element where there might be an answer that you give in private. You might be a secret nose picker thinking it's your private shame, but here, seeing that there are other people, other famous scientists who constantly pick your nose, you might change your response because we've changed the social norm because it's a public question. So this is the sort of thing we can experimentally uh, manipulate. So if we ask a different question, scooch to the hive, there we go. Uh, have you ever cheated on a partner? Now, we're still collecting your responses, but you can't see the dots. So this is an entirely <laughs> private response. So do you give a different response here? Sure, you can see them. So we can ask people to get their responses in private, and what we can do, which we never do in real experiments, then turn the dots on as well. <laughs> of course, we don't know individually who this is. A uh, few people do it often. Someone thinking about it right now and changing their mind. It's probably the nose picker. Uh, so we can examine how these uh, attitudes change as a function of this public thing. You don't know who's giving this response, but you know the distribution of the population. Much like any other thing like voting, right? You know what you chose and you have a vague idea of other people, but you can't really uh, see that representation unless we put it on screen. So let's ask a few more um, scientific-like questions. If you go to the Hive, we can ask people their opinions. So let's try polling this audience on a few items. Uh, what do you think about people who are able to but refuse to work should have their benefits reduced? The sort of statement our current politicians are making. How do you feel about that? True or false or somewhere in the middle? Sorry, that was a little quick. So if you return to the hive, let's try another choice. 
And the next choice is, strangely topical, the UK should leave the EU. We should colour these dots by English people or foreigners and see. We want to stay, but everyone else wants to stay. So we can ask people's responses here. We'll do a couple more, and then I'll show you what we can do with these questions. So if you return to the hive, and then... Um, Uh, just a methodological uh, difference. Um, what we're interested in in lots of these questions is not really do people think we should leave the UK or not, it's how that response, however we phrase it, changes in the social context. So not aiming for the best representation of people's political views, I want to know something about that, then see how that changes. Yes, there are different ways you could ask these questions, and some are better than we have. But again, it's not the, really the answer to the question we care about, because we're experimentalists. We care how that answer changes, depending on what we do to people. Uh, so if you return to the hive again, uh, someone who buys food for their friends has a right to take a larger share. <laughs> if you paid for dinner, you get the last glass of wine. Is the principle. There we go. Uh, so return to the hive. We can also not just ask people's opinions, but ask them to give uh, factual responses to test their general knowledge. So this question is uh, for you to guess the percentage of the UK population that is Muslim, between 0 and 30%. Uh, so you're academics, so you are unusually accurate. <laughs> We can also put people in little mini-games. This is one aspect that we hope to expand, but just because they're asking these sort of static questions, we can ask people to imagine more complicated scenarios. So this is a game we created called Compete, Cooperate or Die, which is the government's new slogan for our NHS. And what it is is a sort of a zombie uh, scenario. So we ask people to imagine you're being attacked by zombies and you have two choices as a group. Imagine they're, they're gathered in the sand and we have to respond to that. And you have the choice to either go out and fight the zombies or hide under your desk. And the dynamic is that if we all decide to fight, we're more likely to survive the more of us join in and fight. But as an individual, you're always more likely to survive if you hide. So how much do you contribute towards the greater good by going out and fighting with a pitchfork? And how much do you look after yourself? We can ask people these simple questions. So here you have the decision to hide or to fight. So return to the hive and then make your decision. We have some political activists and some cowards mixed in all together. That's good. So we can ask people to imagine these uh, public goods games. They're called in behavioral economics, where we describe the scenario and see how they would change their decision in the context of other people's responses. And once more, we can turn on these dots or not, so you can see how other people respond. So if you return to the middle now, what we can do, we don't have a very good uh, sample here because it was only three questions, normally you would ask more, but uh, we can analyze those responses you just gave to those political questions. We can run an algorithm on them and cluster you. So we can put you into two groups, uh, so you're put together with people who gave the same responses to those questions, those three, four political questions. So if you press the button and it should uh, split you into two groups. Uh, and they should go change colors there. So you're red and blue. So now we divided you up into two groups. So if you can move to your particular hive that you've been placed in, whether or not you're a red or a blue. And now that we've uh, identified you and put you in this particular social group, we can say, well, how does that change your responses? So we have a few, someone's changed their allegiance already. <laughs> There's a few traitors, good. Uh, so now we can ask a few other questions. So if everyone goes into the middle for a moment, Let's try asking a few more questions. Uh, terminally ill patients have a right to medically assisted suicide. Would you agree? Is that true or false? Wow. You are not a normal audience, I have to say. Uh, return to the hive. We have, I think, a couple more just to see if this uh, division is valid. Atomic power is essential to secure our energy supply. All right, and do we have one more question? Oh, yeah, we have one more general knowledge question. This time, can you estimate the proportion of the UK population that is Christian on the last survey? All right, again, that's irritatingly accurate. <laughs> it doesn't make my response that most people get this question completely wrong. So in the case of the Muslim uh, case, most people estimate around 20 to 30% of the UK population is Muslim. It's actually closer to 5%. 
people are vastly off in their estimation. Uh, at the time the poll was done by the uh, British Statistical Association, 20% uh, was not the percentage of Muslims, but it was the percentage of Daily Mail articles about Muslims in this country, <laughs> showing that people's estimates of these really important things for policy generation are just completely off. The correct answer to the Christian one is 60%. It's much higher than most people uh, estimate. A Jedi's, yes, we should have a Jedi box. That's a very good point. We need Jedi's. Uh, so cluster in the middle, and let's now ask this zombie question again. But now if we uh, have identified you as a particular social group, does that change your responses? So let's see how you would hide or fight. Now we have clusters you. Ah, interesting. <laughs> Wonderful, and I think that's it. Yes, oh, we have other scenarios where we ask people to, we present them with pictures of men and women and we say which is the more attractive and we turn on the votes of people or not to see how people's uh, choices of date and attraction changes in the social context. But I think we'll skip that, uh, we'll skip that for today. Uh, let me just go to... So in all these cases we can ask... Um, what we're interested in is whether or not people uh, perform better in a very abstract way when they're individuals or a group. And we put this tool together uh, with funding from the Wellcome Trust as both a public engagement tool and a way to collect data. We can only collect data from large numbers of people, and that's hard to do, so we thought, well, let's turn it into a science show, which is very popular in London for some reason. When I was a graduate student, science wasn't popular, now we're, we're sexy. It's never happened before, but people are very keen to turn up to these science events. So we had an event at the Bloomsbury Theatre where we got 100 people to turn up and take part in the show. And we tried to ask this question in many ways. Are people better as individuals or as a group? And we were thinking about all the different facets of human uh, decision making. And we thought, well, what's the one thing that looks like it's really a story about the individual? That if we try and test are we better as individuals or groups, it's really going to come down to individuals. And that is something like creativity. So when you think about art and creativity and the, the giants of the story, it's a story of individuals. It's the story of David Bowie and Miles Davis. And we think of creativity as coming from these people from left wing and doing something that the rest of the culture hasn't done at all. So when we look at that particular aspect of human behavior, it seems to be a story of single individuals. But then again, that's not necessarily true, is it? Because it's certainly the case that David Bowie, although he's sort of an outlier and individual, he also stole liberally from people around him. He stole from fashion people, he stole from other musicians, he stole from experimental theater people. He was part of his culture. And also, people in his culture bought his records. They chose to buy his records, not other people's. Right? Even Miles Davis, who created three different forms of jazz entirely by himself, he was still beholden to the public. They were still selecting and reinforcing what he was doing. So even though culturally we have this trope about the lone individual genius, is that really true? Maybe creativity can emerge from a group of people, even though we think of committees as being something that always reach a boring compromise. And if we did only have uh, music created by committees, we'd end up with sort of bland pop as opposed to this really interesting artistic stuff. So this was just sort of an exercise, but it got quite interesting results. We thought, well, how can we possibly test this with the hive? Uh, we brought in some jazz musicians from Loom Music, and we asked them to improvise three, four-minute pieces in front of the audience. While they were playing, the audience was giving them instruction and feedback in how to play. And the jazz musicians are very interested in this because uh, well, they, they like to perform live, right? It's a, really, it's a live medium. But why is that? What are they getting from the audience? Normally, jazz crowds will nod. They won't clap because they're too cool to clap. Well, they'll give some sort of feedback to the musicians, but it's a very thin channel. Jazz musicians don't get much information from their audience, but they do get some, and they do talk about how they respond to the mood of the crowd. So we thought, well, let's make that explicit. Let's give them feedback. Let's let people instruct them how to improvise. So let's see if we have the sound working. This is one of our shows here, and everyone was using the system like you were. And in this particular case, they're just moving their dots to these different patterns of time.
Well, again, this is the journey we're still at the beginning of, but we can do very simple things on the metrics, the dynamics of people moving those dots. We can see how much people clustered together, how much people moved off as outliers, and how much they stayed as a group. What we should have saw in GoFu is most people clustered together, because there were a few people who really wanted to influence them, and they would move, and then they would move their dot friend and leader, like a child who was really wanting to take them, and gradually they would drag everyone else around with them. So we can very simply plot things like, well, how much control do you think you had over the musicians? Did you feel entirely passive, or did you feel like they were responding to you? And the influence that people felt they had correlates with how far they were from the group. So if the people who moved away from the population clusters, who felt like they were having the biggest causal influence over what was being played. You can also ask questions like, well, does the amount of activity change? The more people move their dot around, the more they like that music suggesting that the sense of control and interaction between the audience and the music change their liking of it. And perhaps this is one reason out of many that we go to see live music. That sense that might be an illusion that Taylor Swift or Miles Davis is responding to what you're doing. That may be illusionary, but that idea that you're controlling and causally influencing the musician seems to at least correlate with how much enjoyment people have. So what I'm going to do now is pass over to Jarena, and she's going to explain a few of the results we've been able to get already uh, with this tool. And for the music part, we actually had one group um, which was so coordinated that they were starting to tease the musicians. I always think that's a really funny story, because they always went into the middle, and then the musicians didn't know what to do, and then they spread out and were really playing with them. That was, that was really interesting to see how an entire group of people was able just to yeah, tease, tease professional jazz musicians. Um, all right, so I'm going to explain some, or I'm going to tell you something about the results that we have collected so far. And I mean, this entire conference has sort of um, discussed a little bit about how, you know, we either portray crowds as, as wise or as mad, mostly mad in public opinion and very often in science as well. Um, but we're sort of interested in seeing how individual and groups mutually influence each other and how that might not be one or the other. It might be something completely different and we shouldn't judge whether it's wise or mad, but we're just wanting to see how the dynamics between individuals and groups evolve and how the context changes behavior and cognition and emotion. Uh, and while we started with something that is very classic, I don't think I need to sort of explain the experiment uh, that was done by Ash on conformity in case um, there is somebody in the, in the audience who doesn't know. It was a group of people and one, well, it was a group of confederates, and then one participant came in and was asked which of these lines corresponds to line X. And very clearly, I can't really see it, that's B. But before he was allowed to answer, all of the other confederates were giving their answer, and they were all saying, well, it's A. And then they tested sort of under which circumstances the participant would give a clearly wrong answer to the question he was asked. And um, what they found was the more confederates there were, the more likely that particip or participants in general would become to answer or provide a wrong answer. So that's, um, yeah, that became sort of the most classic exper experiment in conformity. And then there's another form of conformity which is a little different because it relates to ambiguous situation, which is Ash, uh, it's, and he studied something called the autokinetic <laughs> effect. So when you're in a dark room and you see a flickering light, then it seems to be moving, but it's a perceptual illusion, so it doesn't really happen. Um, and he got people into the lab and asked them to look at this dot moving in the dark. And he got them in on multiple days, and what he found is that people over time converge in their opinion. So even though, even though, um, uh, even though it's different for every single person what they see, they actually came to a conclusion and decided, well, yeah, we actually all saw the same thing. <coughs> and we tried to sort of replicate that with the hive. So we showed people. Keep yeah. <laughs> well, I can keep talking. So we showed, we didn't use the autokinetic effect, but what we did is we showed people flickering, lots of flickering dots on a black screen. And sometimes they were moving slightly to the right, sometimes they were slightly moving to the left. Uh, and on some conditions, or in some, uh, yeah, for some of the conditions, the light, um, they were flickering in such a way that you couldn't say, see whether it was left or right. But we always force people to, to say, well, they were moving to the right or they were moving to the left. But then we use that function of the hive, say, um, sending secret messages to 10% of our audience members and said, OK, in these ambiguous situations that we have, you all move to the right-hand side, sort of creating the situation in which you get a majority of people making a choice 
even though the situation is completely ambiguous. There you go. Yeah, so that was what we showed them. So you don't really know in which directions the dots are really moving. But then we asked people, okay, make your choice. 10% of audience members uh, were told to move to the right. Um, and I mean, essentially, it should be a 50-50% split, right? Because it's ambiguous, so you don't know. Um, yeah, each, each of these options should, should have been as likely to be picked. But what we found was that there was actually, we were actually able to clearly bias our audience. So there was a big shift to the right whenever we told some people of the audience to move to the right. We actually found that in the data later on that more people were moving to the right, even though it should have been clearly sort of an, a normal distribution. Um, so that was that for the conformity part. Then we also sort of played around a little bit with social identity. We didn't look at sort of more pronounced social identities as we have with football fans or goths or any kind of group. I don't really know what the guys on the, in the bottom are. I don't really know what they belong to, but clearly they sort of share some kind of social identity. Um, but we were sort of more interested in the, in the minimal groups paradigm um, and wondering, you know, if we just keep... keep putting people into, into groups completely arbitrarily by telling them you're in group A, you're in group B, or you know the, the typical experiment about Click and Dinsky, these kind of things, what would happen? How would that sort of influence their choices? And you've just experienced that in the hive as well, right? So if you answer questions and then we put you into groups, and that may, may or may have not changed your opinion. Oh, or so how you answer these questions. Explain. So I lied. We don't have an no, algorithm to tell. look at your That's things. That's right there. Oh, okay. Oh, sorry. Yeah. <laughs> I was guilty because I lied. Uh, yeah, well, so Daniel lied. He lies all the time. <laughs> <laughs> Particularly to his grad students. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, so we told participants, as we told you, that there is this, this algorithm that we run to sort of provide them with a little more sense in the, in the shared identity that we're subscribing, subscribing to them. But actually, we didn't do that. So we don't have this algorithm. It was completely arbitrary how we then color the dots afterwards. But I mean, I'm, I'm not sure if you bought it, but all of our participants bought it. So yeah, everybody kind of believed that we're that smart and we have this algorithm and clustered them according to opinion. But it was enough to sort of just say, okay, well, we did that and um, you were then part of one group or the other. Uh, yeah, so this is what you saw as well, providing you with a social identity and then we got them to move together. And what we found is something interesting. So you, if you look at the graph, is that pretty much if if it's, if, if it's a private so choice, so you make your choice, but you don't really know what everyone else picks, that doesn't really do anything in comparison to everybody as part of the same group. So we find exactly the same sort of proportion of movement uh, for these two cases. But then as soon as, you, uh, as you're clustered in groups, or when we clustered the people in groups, we found that they were moving to the extremes. So they were taking very different positions as before. So their opinion became more extreme. And when it says, so on the... On the axis, it says strength of opinion, distance from center. When we talk about center, we mean the center of the, of the scale. So whereas before, the center, like the distribution around the center didn't really matter or didn't really change depending on the condition, it did change as soon as we provided people with a social identity. Um, yeah, and since we're not only interested in sort of decision making, but also in movement and how groups that act together actually um, influence the individual group members. Um, we also have quite, quite a few experiments in relation to that. And um, one of them, in one of them, we sort of looked at verbal synchrony in large groups because we wanted to sort of explore if synchrony is actually something that influences groups as well as pairs because most of the studies, as Daniel mentioned, are actually done in pairs. So we just wanted to see if these things scale up. And um, <coughs> so we got... <laughs> um, yeah, so we have one experiment which, in which we use Bob, who is a tightrope walker, and it's a, it's a game that lots of people can play together using response handsets. So this is actually not, not with a hive. This was sort of... A pr like a study that we did beforehand and then we build another experiment based on that. And um, so Bob is, is um, walking on a tightrope and he's, uh, oh, do we have tomatoes? Yes. So during the game, tomatoes are being thrown at Bob so that he's swaying to the left or right. And if there are too many tomatoes and you don't press your response handsets in an appropriate way, he will fall off the tightrope. And the aim of the game is to sort of always keep him upright 
for 30 seconds with increasing difficulty. And when I say increasing difficulty, it just means there are more tomatoes being thrown at him, so it gets more and more difficult. And people obviously in the audience then all have to coordinate their, their clicks because only together they can keep them upright. And so we had really large groups at times, and we got them all to chant together. Oh, yeah. yeah, so this is what it looks like. We've got the audience sitting down, sitting and staring at the screen. <laughs> yeah, you get a lot of upset people when whenever Bob falls down and lots of screaming, left, left, right, right. So people get really excited about this quite simple game. But um, so our manipulation was that we got some groups to jointly speak words together and other groups we asked to sort of speak out words aloud but individually. So I'm not sure, I think there's a little video. So in the joint speaking condition, people were just reading out the words all together at the same time for 90 seconds. Uh, and in the individual speaking condition, they all started at different points on the list and they were just reading these words individually. And um, we told them to remember these words because there would be a memory test afterwards. Um, yeah, and so after they, they had read for about 90 seconds, they would then move on to playing that game. And what we were interested in was to see if the groups that had chanted together, so that had synchronized their actions before, and if they might be better coordinated, if they would like each other more, and if they would possibly even remember more of these words. Um, yeah, and this is, this is kind of what we found. So if you look at the first graph on the left, um, you see the vertical distance and the difficulty level. What that means is that with increasing difficulty of the game, so more tomatoes being thrown at Bob, the group that chanted together was able to keep him very vertical, well, comparatively vert vertical. So the non-chanting group, Bob, was drifting to the left and to the right far more than the group that had chanted together, but only so if the difficulty level had increased. So at, you can see that in the, in the beginning for the for the not-so-difficult levels, they, they were pretty much the same, and then all of a sudden we saw a difference between the groups with increasing difficulty. Um, we also saw, in terms of performance, that the group that had chanted together um, were clicking earlier, at an earlier point, whenever Bob was tilting to one side or the other, so they seemed to have clicked yeah, at an earlier point in time. So if you look at the angle on the y-axis, um, people in the non-chanting group was sort of clicking at later stages. So he was already tilting further to the right or to the left before they actually made their choice. Um, we did find that they actually remembered more words if they had chanted together, so that was sort of uh, quite interesting. I think, I'm not sure how much on average. I think they remembered about three words more on average, which was quite a lot, so that was quite a, quite a big effect. And they also did, um, did like each other much more than the group who had not chanted together. And of course, we don't really know if this is sort of an effect of how well they performed during the game. So the groups might have liked each other more because they were better in the game. But there is a chance that it might also just be related to the synchrony. That's something that we can't really tell from, from that particular experiment. Um, so this, this was the one of the experiments that we did. And then we tried to sort of replicate it in a different environment with a hive that you just experienced. Um, and what we told people to do was that they had 10 sec seconds to move down these sort of race tracks. And we told them that the only thing that they had to do was to stay as closely together as possible, which is actually really difficult. So we thought it was pretty easy, but well, and then we actually tried it. And as you can see, it doesn't really look very coordinated at all. But looking at sort of the, the, all of the little dots moving together, we did see a pattern, which is we can see here, that the participants who did chant together were actually much closer together than the other group. Um, and it says mean distance to center. Center here is referring to a midpoint between all of the points. So if you've got group per group, all of the points moving uh, down together, we took the average in the middle and then calculated the distance for every single dot. And we found that the group that had chanted together, they um, were closer together and were able to move as a cluster or more so as a cluster in on those race tracks. Yeah, and I think that's that's it for now. So in the future, 
we would, of course, like to sort of have more game-like situations. So for now, we've sort of looked mostly at more classical ideas or have tried to replicate things that we've found in other experiments not using the hive. Um, but we would like to sort of look at cooperation and competition. Um, we're very interested in sort of group conflict, maybe having um, a few more things about social identity and actually getting, getting something that is a bit more pronounced than just minimal groups. Um, and we've also planned a project on inequality where we sort of wanted to see what happens in, in cases where groups actually are of unequal status and how that will sort of influence their behavior. Yeah, and we're very happy for new ideas. I think that's it, right? Yes. So next speaker is uh, Gavin Sullivan from uh, the University of Coventry who is going to talk about uh, collective identity. Okay, well, thank you very much for inviting me along. Um, I know I'm uh, replacing someone who unfortunately had an injury, but uh, so my gain is uh, their loss. Um, okay, um, I'll try to keep active, keep moving around, um, keep you entertained for at least 30 minutes. Um, can you hear me okay, or do I need to, to shout a little more? Oh really? Out of the oh, I've, I'm being recorded. Okay, <laughs> all right. Edit that piece, please. <laughs> okay, so I'm going to take you through some conceptual and empirical issues exemplified by collective pride research, particularly um, focusing on pride. But this is just some examples of more general work I've done. So this was a particular analysis. Uh, quite a simple analysis, but it was how a city mourns, looking at some of the reactions and then counter-reactions to the uh, events here in, in Paris, of course, uh, the November 13 attack. Um, so I won't go into detail about that, but I think uh, I was interested in, in exploring how collective emotion can be a little more strategic and, and can also have some surprising effects. Uh, for example, while... Panic doesn't necessarily occur except in isolated um, areas. Nevertheless, there's, a, there's kind of people are jumpy because they can misread uh, noises and so on and react to those. Uh, so there were stories of minor kind of reactions to uh, situations that were not risky at all. Um, and another example also of a piece that uh, was quite theoretical. Uh, is this one that I wrote for Social and Personality Compass. Um, so this is where I, I do quite a, an in-depth analysis, uh, particularly of um, some issues that I'll talk about today, but that's just the paper, and if you'd like a copy of it, please, please send it to me. Uh, please send me an email and I can provide that. So to give you an overview, I'll talk reasonably uh, lengthily, I guess, about why uh, it's worthwhile focusing on collective pride and also some of the limits of it because we've seen um, these different terms being used to refer to what I call collective pride. Um, then I'll take you through some conceptual and theoretical issues. Uh, these are sometimes in ideas in flux. I always like to do a different presentation every time. I'd like to challenge myself, so uh, it might be challenging also for you, but in a good way and I'll talk about some empirical projects, so I'm not going to be just uh, theoretical. All right, in terms of why focusing on collective pride um, and also uh, switching back very quickly, you'll see at the, the right-hand side there, Understanding Collective Pride and Group Identity, a book I edited, uh, which has chapters by Miko and Chris and, um, and many others, uh, which was trying to be cutting edge about collective pride, in part to build upon and extend work that had been done on collective guilt. So that seemed to be a very well-established topic. And somewhat bizarrely, collective pride really didn't seem to connect with collective uh, guilt at all, at least in, let me reverse that, collective guilt. Uh, in the book, there's very little mention of collective pride, um, but there are some interesting dynamics there. Um, so this was really, uh, this is, um, the work I'm doing is a theoretically driven approach. So I started off with this focus on collective pride. What is it? What context does it occur in? What types of topics does it connect with, such as collective shame? What are the dynamics and so on? 
Um, but I found that there's quite a lot of overlap with other areas, so ecstatic nationalism versus banal nationalism, so drawing upon Mike, uh, Mick Billig's work, so I've got a chapter out on that soon. Um, mega sporting events are one of the key kind of paradigm situations, particularly crowds, and some of my interest in this topic was driven by going, uh, essentially doing an ethnography of, of uh, public viewing crowds in Berlin. Uh, near the Brandenburger Tor, where there were somewhat, something close to a million people focused on one event, uh, but also the, um, the World Cup and the Euro, uh, so starting from the World Cup 2006, some of those games had percentages of, of the public viewing these at around 65 to 70 percent uh, for some of the more popular games. So also uh, some links with riots as well. Um, <laughs> So uh, where Clifford was talking about joy, that's kind of where I would talk about collective pride um, in this power to challenge the police and take a space and control it and have the police on the run. This enormous pleasure in being able to do this and reverse this power difference. So collective pride um, does also overlap with some of these other terms, collective self-esteem, which I tend not to use much. I tend not to use those scales much. Uh, also with emotions of collective self-realisation. I haven't explored the similarities there. Uh, and it does also fit with nationalism and patriotism, and depending on how you examine na nationalism and patriotism, nationalism is usually the bad equivalent of a kind of authentic... Uh, sorry, nationalism is kind of the equivalent of um, a collective hubristic pride, and patriotism is kind of a... Uh, collective, uh, authentic pride, if you like. If, uh, so that's extending some work on individual pride. That's a rough way of making the distinction, but nationalism is normally seen as, as bad, patriotism good, and there are links with uh, a range of, of issues, such as um, attitudes towards uh, other groups or refugees or um, out-group members and how much you extend solidarity. So patriotism tends to be more inclusive and open. What about the group sizes? Well, there's, there's a literature now which even includes um, collective emotions just in couples. So uh, Joel Kruger has, has written a paper not so long ago about collective grief and how that, just in a, in a couple, don't just have a, each have separate emotions that they share with each other as individuals, almost on the, ob uh, almost on the picture of I'm giving a, um, a physical object to another person. Uh, but rather that they're so closely aligned that it's their pride, uh, sorry, their grief as a couple um, in relation to something like loss of a child. So he makes that case. I'm not so interested in couples, uh, families or teams, although these are instances of collective pride. Uh, and that's why I note there, not team pride. If anything, I'm interested in where a team is the object of national pride or a national group. That's the kind of exemplar I'm interested in. So not just a team itself and how it may come to share uh, emotions in a particular task or in an organisation or a sporting team, but rather what it's like to be the object of, of a nation's love or hate. Um, and there is also actually a literature on love and hate applied to these topics. So what I talk about is, is collective pride. Some people talk about generally as kind of group love. Now, collective pr uh, pride also occurs, I guess this is a very rough attempt at a definition, when a group uh, or its representatives achieves or maintains or resists, now that's the complex aspect of it, uh, <coughs> goals or standards through collective action, and that's on a basement of, uh, base of, of collective commitment. So this is already starting to show some links with the social ontology literature uh, of Ramo Tuamela and others. So I mentioned kind of maintaining a standard being important sometimes for pride as well. Uh, the, I think some of the problems with collective pride is it's almost modelled on individual pride, which tends to be mainly achievement situations, and much less about um, maintaining a level of pride or, under considerable duress, uh, simply resisting, maintaining some core sense of self. So I'll return to that uh, with this point here, because I think there are... This is kind of a, a very rough typology, uh, which I've used so far, to describe the context in which collective pride occurs, <coughs> and as, as generally being celebrations, there's usually not any obvious outgroup, although people exclude themselves from the group. So things like a, a national jubilee, for example, 
Um, it seems to be generally inclusive. There's no active, uh, apart from the people invited to, to sing and so on, uh, there's generally no, no exclusion. Versus competitions, examples of, of kind of national teams playing each other, uh, but also conflicts. And here you get some very interesting dynamics of collective pride is what's referred to as collective pride is, is not anything particularly positive in emotional terms at all. Uh, in fact, it can be more like defiance or even uh, anger um, in resistance. So that, those uh, emotional configurations and dynamics are important. And what I'm interested in also is how you might have a transition from pride to shame in a given instance. I'll try, I'll try to give you an example of that soon. Um, so it is important to engage in some good um, conceptual and theoretical work about what the causes, consequences, and functions of collective pride are, and to examine those. Um, and those are not the only ways, of course, of, of working up uh, collective pride. Um, so one of the things I'm, I'm quite uh, critical of, and I'm trying to, to avoid, um, so I'm including myself in the, in the kind of these criticisms, is, is a focus on kind of discrete collective emotions, I think is, is quite limiting. Uh, I think they're far more fluid, and often sometimes we're really talking about something more like affect, where it's not uh, really obvious that there's something more than effervescence or a really close organisation in, involved. So there are issues of embodiment, effervescence, and then also the context, which still might not create, be enough to create collective pride. It could still just be... Um, aggregate happiness. So that is a clear instance where social identity or a collective identity is crucial to making the difference. And then usually you would expect that to, to see that manifest in differences in collective action. Okay. So also reasons for focusing on collective pride as well. My argument is that explanation should include top-down and bottom-up processes. So we have bottom-up processes where individuals will get together uh, they will share emotions. Out of this, a broader, um, a broader identity or, or emotion might occur. But then also, we have top-down as well. And there are, it's important to combine both of these in, in analyses. This is part of my argument. Collective Pride nicely shows this. In the lead-in to um, the World Cup in Germany, for example, you start to see these, especially around 2006, this was preceded by debates around should we even feel pr proud or not. These political elites debating whether this is an emotion that's even desirable. Um, then you have people as individuals saying, I can't possibly feel proud of, of the national team because I'm not responsible for the national team. And that was their articulated reason for not sharing in these emotions. Uh, that has transformed, of course. Um, and some of the taboos over exp uh, expressing national pride have, have completely changed in Germany now. Um, also, what I'm doing here is, is challenging methodological individualism. Um, so methodological individualism is, is, I think, a reductive strategy and a reductive ontology. And I think we need to be careful of that. Uh, I think we need to maintain explanatory autonomy of different levels. We need to be careful both on the, the level of micro-reduction and macro-reduction, going broader. Um, so we need to keep the autonomy of those different levels of explanation and, and make that part of interdisciplinary work. But that means there are some uncomfortable ontological implications sometimes. And um, so the social ontology um, uh, people, Ramo Tuamela, for example, is really challenged on this. Is there really group agency? Do you really want to be a realist about group agency, even though he admits that individuals are uh, ontologically the causal motors, he still says there is, there is a real thing called group agency that cannot be reduced to the individuals. Um, and then there are some other consequences that go along with that conceptually. Okay. In terms of functions, to give you some idea of the functions involved with collective pride, um, sometimes it can be to offset collective shame um, to, to restore positive in-group um, uh, identity or feeling. And so there is a nice example. Uh, with Germany, there is a nice example there. When you look historically and then in terms of World Cups and so on, that there has been this extended period of memorialization and, and um, working through at a collective level of, uh, of uh, 
the Holocaust and the Nazi era, of course. That's not the only example. You find some quite interesting dynamics where people um, shift between a position, endorsing a position of collective shame, and then sometimes switching to collective pride. Um, I'm not articulating it very well, but there are some interesting dynamics there about how one starts to replace the other. Um, and so you can find even uh, with issues like apologies. So uh, in Australia, there were apologies to the, what were called the stolen generation, Aboriginal families taken from their children uh, by the government in the 1950s. And this was never acknowledged as a government policy. Uh, finally, there was a, with a Labor government coming in, this was in the late 90s, I think, or early 2000s, I can't remember now. Um, but there was a pride in acknowledging this and giving the apology. Uh, and it was very interesting to see people outside Parliament um, basically clapping when the apology uh, happened, after it happened. That points to another issue I'll talk about as well, as kind of vocal or, or linguistic um, affiliative responses as an agentic response. I'm interested in exploring that. I'll talk about that a little uh, uh, soon. <laughs> um, but collective shame, just on this point again, it can be an unforeseen consequence or an unpredicted consequence of pursuing group goals. Now, what I have in mind here is something I'll talk about um, if I have time towards the end. But a colleague of mine, Thomas Kuhn, and I, we did interviews after the World Cup semi-final defeat in, um, in Brazil. Uh, interviews around what people felt, what it was like the next day. Um, essentially, something to the effect of collective shame. That's what we were looking at to see how that individualised, divided people. The next day, uh, they felt demoralised, lacking in energy, but they couldn't share it with anyone else. Um, and and as, this, as, as the game unfolded, people started making jokes online and tweeting. There was an expectation this was going to lead to violence, uh, but it didn't. It mainly led to humour and, and disappointment, attempts to laugh it off. But actually, it, it, the, the effects persisted. Um, so I'll return to that a little later. Um, but also, in this whole approach, I'm not assuming a discrete collective positive emotion in fact, uh, some of the work on protests, for example, shows that there's a mixture, um, and it can be even emotions of different valence, so a mixture of pride and anger um, that's often interspersed in um, protest marches, for example. So I'm very interested in this, in working up um, the idea of collective mixed emotions and that being actually not as abnormal as it sounds but potentially also vacillating mixed emotions, where you switch between, a whole group could switch between a positive and then a negative emotion relatively quickly. Um, and I'm trying to explore some case examples of that. Okay, so further reasons for looking at collective pride, there were dynamic relations with other collective and group-based emotions. So I think it's important to mention here that group-based emotions are those individual emotions you might feel by yourself on behalf of your group whereas collective emotions are genuinely widespread at a very broad level. Um, so Randall Collins has done some very nice work, I think, but it's still quite speculative on uh, what he calls time bubbles of nationalism. So he was, say, he was writing particularly about the um, um, uh, Tahrir Square and the results of that. And it's very interesting that he says that the, the greatest period of risk is after this victory over the, the, the government. Uh, that, that he thought was the particularly risky point where, where although there's a lot of good feeling at, at the group having achieved um, its ends politically, that there might then be some backlash against other groups. And I think also here, what's interesting with collective pride is to look at, at where there's a boundary between collective pride and collective arrogance. Um, so I mentioned that risk perhaps of something like violent revenge when a group gets into a position of power. Are they magnanimous or do they take revenge? A um, very different example is Nokia. So Nokia is a case study of a company in which they reached a point where they didn't feel that they could fail. And so they invested, they made decisions, uh, but never with the, the thought that they might fail. And then to have to be sold, I think, for one euro or something close to that um, was profoundly um, humiliating. Um, so that's an instance, perhaps, of collective arrogance where there's a failure to, to anticipate possible error 
um, or not to consider stakeholders. All right, um, so also case studies here might have transferable lessons. Uh, so, for example, kind of uh, celebrations that lead to riots. I've mentioned an example and to some of you already of, a, of Atletico Madrid's victory a few years ago, um, and I think it was in the Europa League, I can't remember. But they went to celebrate where Real Madrid usually celebrates in the central space, and the police said, no, you can't do that. And the indignation led to clashes with police and uh, images of, of um, yeah, uh, tear gas and so on and, um, and isolated incidents in the street. Now, that seems to be an example of where police mismanagement of this really exacerbated the problem. Um, so you have this transformation of something which, which should really have been a celebration into to a situation that's described as a riot. Some conceptual and theoretical issues um, that are really, I think, interesting to examine, and I do try to do that a, a little in, the, uh, in that paper I mentioned earlier in Social and Personality Compass, is uh, social ontology's use of the we mode versus I mode distinction. And both Chris and, and Miko have particularly uh, uh, taken this analysis on and developed it. Uh, and I think... Um, there are still some factors which it would be very interesting to see, and it's, it's actually kind of exciting for me to see some of the people who, who focus a lot more on we mode versus I mode analyses uh, and social identity theorists or elaborated social identity theorists in the same room starting to discuss these issues of what's in common, what's still different. Uh, but I think there's a lot of potential for overlap here because we mode, you know, genuinely acting as a group, um, having a role in a group with a collective commitment to what the, the group is trying to achieve and then the emotions that that generates, uh, that is undermined by individual needs, when individual needs become uh, prominent as opposed to the group's needs. Uh, so a good example of that, I think, is some recent work. Um, it may have been John's work, I'm not sure, but it was looking at uh, crowd density and the fact that crowd density has an impact on identity. So you start to, there's a certain point where you, you, your social identity is undermined by the density of the crowd. I think because it's prioritising individual needs, it's, there's discomfort, it's unpleasant, you may feel at risk, and so you disengage, I think, from the group. That's a possible explanation. So I think there's a lot of interesting work that can be done incorporating and communicating between we mode versus I mode um, analyses and social identity theory, but also there are very interesting ideas, as I was saying, around group agency, this being a genuinely group-level phenomenon. Um, also group reasons linked to an ethos. So, uh, for example, where you're a member of a group um, and um, perhaps you always attend away games and you say, well, I'm just too busy now, I can't attend away games, or there may be better examples than this, but we'll go with it. Um, so the ethos is you always support the team, you always turn up. And if you start to say, well, well you know, there are other reasons why I have to do this, uh, the group may then decide, well, you don't really have full status or full membership anymore. So this is, uh, the, the idea here is where there are group level reasons, not just individual reasons. Um, and that's, I think, quite interesting. Um, uh, I found an example a while ago, which was a... Um, uh, a Uruguayan journalist talking about the feeling in Uruguay after uh, Suarez was uh, ejected from the World Cup, the last World Cup. And it was a very nice example where he said, look, I want to go with this idea that there's a conspiracy against Uruguay, but I just can't do it. <laughs> I, I want to. Everything about this makes me feel like I want to join in with it, but the rational side of me, I can't. Um, so it was very interesting how he was saying, I, I just cannot go with this, uh, where that was leading. Uh, and that certainly became quite prominent, this feeling of it, it, it wasn't his reason or his fault uh, with some bigger conspiracy. OK. Um, also here I mentioned this, um, and I'll reiterate the point quickly. Clarification of terms I think is important. Collective self-esteem. Collective pride, is that really what I mean? Um, is it just joy? Is it aggregate happiness? Sometimes it is. Um, so it's important to look at the differences and similarities. Collective empowerment, I think, is, is quite similar. But 
if I have time, I'll try to give a brief analysis of why I think collective pride and collective empowerment are different. Okay. Um, oh, and here it is. Um, so I, one uh, nascent idea is that enduring empowerment, positive emotions for collective action, um, has a different structure and impact in the longer term of a group over time in, in contrast to national pride around uh, representative teams, World Cups and so on, is simply because you're following a team that you're not responsible for, your active involvement is quite limited, although it might reflect on you and you can take something from this or say this is about us, because it's not something you do, uh, it's not surprising then that it doesn't last for very long after the last game. And so there's some work about uh, national pride and how that diminishes quite quickly, even after a World Cup victory. Um, actually, there are other ways that collector pride and, and national pride persist, uh, but you need to be sensitive and aware of them. And so, for, again, using the example of Germany, there was a film, Ein Sommermärchen, uh, which was a box office hit. Essentially, it was a documentary about the World Cup uh, team in 2006 in Germany. So that spun on the effect a few months later. People went to that. It was a box office hit. And then there were other sporting events that were enthusiastically followed as a result, um, more than normal, a handball victory in a following kind of six months or so. OK, so uh, I think I've got about five minutes left. I'll try to take you through some of these examples really quickly. I think also we need to do, still we need to do some careful conceptual analysis around what shared means. Sometimes when I read shared, it's as if I'm expressing something quite individual and coordinating it with you. At other times, it's common to us, and it's just expressed in a particular context or form. So I think sometimes this is, this is not always clear in the literature. I think sometimes we drop back on individualistic accounts of emotion. Um, collective pride, patriotism, I think, um, can also play a role in supporting resilience. So there's... Um, uh, for example, I've mentioned it here, just as experienced as anger about an ethos of intolerable uh, treatment, for example. So I think collective pride, patriotism, some of these forms of identity but uh, take the form of defiance and resistance still are explicable or understandable in terms of collective pride, but they don't look much like uh, the positive emotion of collective pride. Okay. So there's further work that's useful. Ritual analysis, narrative analyses um, are important. Uh, for example, where previous victories might be referred to by a team. Um, in the work I did in South Africa, people talked about uh, the games in the World Cup, uh, that the feeling in public viewing was similar to when Mandela was released. It was the same feeling. It, it felt similar. Um, also, the idea of shared attention um, usually, if people are looking at a big screen, that's a nice example because they're fo focusing mainly on the screen. But it's a little different in a protest mar mar uh, march, for example, because the attention shifts and it may be that people feel particular emotions more around speeches by representatives and so on, and, and that shifts and changes. Um, last point here, I think, connects with the previous topic, which is collective linguistic and verbal expression. So this is going to sound a little different, but out of some of this work, looking at chants and how chanting and rituals of particularly highly identified and, and highly committed group members, um, merging out of that work, I've now started to look at uh, where there are vocalizations of, and quite complex ones, coordinated ones, of affiliation and disaffiliation. This is an old kind of literature, but it's worth, well worthwhile bringing it back. So there's a BBC uh, television program, Question Time, and before the election, I've been analysing examples of anger around the government's decisions, <laughs> and at what point people join in and affiliate or disaffiliate, and there's actually some very rich work there about how they do that and how they coordinate it very quickly. Um, they're not just individual aggregate boos. They're actually quite coordinated um, with an intensity as well as uh, a kind of a directedness. All right, I have about two minutes left, so a couple of more points. Um, I think it's worth considering also some very good work um, on effective atmospheres from psychogeography, you know, public spaces, and whether we have collective action tendencies to celebrate in particular places or particular times. 
and how we know to do that, how that's set up in advance. We had the example of the celebrations with Atletico Madrid that went awry, but, um, but there are many others, not just sites of national symbols, things, places like the Brandenburger Tor, but um, other more complicated uh, examples. Okay, um, and then there are evocations and narratives of pride and sacrifice at memorial events. So this is something much more um, about sacrifice, but still pride. Uh, pride is referred to or worked up discursively, but it's often quite a sombre atmosphere, and it's one of, of um, very much of trying to evoke solidarity, but often also um, um, one of sacrifice. Um, some final issues here, I'm very keen to do some work on reconciliation rituals and practices after conflicts. So it's very similar to uh, Bernard uh, Rime's work. Uh, and I've done a little bit of work on kind of restoration of national pride and unity after group conflicts, whether that is possible, whether it's desirable or not. Uh, in about the 30 seconds I've got left, this is some of the uh, empirical projects I've done. Um, I guess this is an example of what's called slow academia. Um, They've taken a very, very long time to get these to, to a point of, of being able to submit them. But uh, one is, is interviews and work I did in South Africa during the World Cup, uh, particularly being in downtown Johannesburg, interviewing people around that, but also going out on the streets, uh, going to public viewing, um, just experiencing things that hadn't happened at other World Cups. So bef in the couple of days before the World Cup started, People were out on the streets in Johannesburg dancing in the street, um, which I've not seen any other mega sporting event. Um, so there's a good example of dance being a shared kind of way of, of celebrating something. People were saying, we just can't wait, we're so excited. Uh, but also after a goal was scored in public viewing, people started dancing and I thought they'll do this for about 10 or 20 seconds. They turned to each other in groups and continued dancing uh, until there was another goal scored against them. They weren't looking at the game at all. They were in a group focused on each other, just enjoying the moment um, and extending it. Um, also, this example of collective shame from Brazil, so the interviews there are really very interesting, um, looking at how um, people in Brazil tried to say that, uh, that uh, it's just a game, so what, and then nevertheless felt that this is deeply kind of embarrassing or humiliating, this connection with a 7-0 loss. Um, and how that was experienced and how it almost became a taboo to talk about it. So people, one of, my, one of the participants I interviewed said it was, it was therapeutic talking to me because he hadn't had a chance to talk through this. Um, and it was uh, something he enjoyed talking about, how upset he was about this loss and links with a Maracanã disaster and other uh, kind of cultural stories. Two other studies briefly, and, and then I'll, I'll finish. Um, so uh, a three-wave study, uh, believe it or not, of the Euro 2008. We're finally writing that up. Uh, that was because we did interviews with the same people before, during, and after. We we're interested in the level of engagement, the type of engagement. What was interesting is we found people resisting the atmosphere, the kind of general carnival or collective kind of party atmosphere or party, party patriotismos, as it was called, party patriotism. Um, so uh, that is a very good example of some of the work that's being done now where people feel that the group is not experiencing the collective emotions they feel it should and so they have different emotions in, in, as a result. So there is some empirical work around that, not just my uh, vague idea of it. And finally, attempts to model crowd interactions um, in expressive behaviour and public viewing. Um, there are... Uh, that is, is an attempt to show there's some evidence for these uh, ramblings. Um, so uh, if any of those look of interest, please uh, send me an email. Um, also, um, very, very interested in collaboration. So um, that's always, uh, always most welcome. And um, I think that's it. Thank you.